Welcome to the Health Trip Podcast. My name is Jill Foos. I'm a functional medicine and integrative nutrition health coach. I created this podcast to bring you along as we travel down intriguing science-packed roads, debunking old medical paradigms and perusing new innovative therapies and modalities with the finest functional medicine doctors, practitioners, and like-minded biohackers while living our best life. Enjoy the show. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Health Trip Podcast. I am no stranger to ADHD or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. It's one of the most common childhood disorders and can continue through adolescence and adulthood. While I don't have it, my ex-husband and some of my five kids do, so I've lived with both the adult and children or kid versions of it for many decades. I saw the frustration, the irritability, the impulsivity, the agony over making a decision, the lack of focus, the lack of sleep, the decreased appetite, the mood swings, the challenge of being social at times, the ups and downs of finding the right meds and the wear off effects. ADHD looks different in everyone, usually coexisting with other conditions such as depression, anxiety, OCD, disruptive behavior disorders, learning disabilities, sleep disorders, and substance abuse. Some of my kids were super organized and some were not. The spectrum is wide. Here's some current stats. It's estimated that from 2016 to 2019, kids ages three to 17, there were 6 million diagnosed with ADHD. 50% of those also had a behavioral disorder. 30% had anxiety, 17% had depression, and 77% of all those kids were in treatment of some kind. So ADHD treatment ranges from pharmacologic interventions to more holistic approaches and somewhere in between maybe a combination of the two. Most people's experience, such as mine, when my kids were young, was to go to your pediatrician or a psychiatrist and be sent home with a script for a stimulant, told when to have your kid take it and check back in 30 days. If that med didn't work, there were a host of other options. And if that approach didn't work, you were sent home with two scripts, maybe more, to manage symptoms. Meanwhile, your child was zombie-like, not eating or sleeping, not hanging with their friends anymore. But guess what? They also weren't bouncing off the walls. What else can we do for our ADHD kids who are going to eventually become teens, young adults, and older adults someday? I'm not against medication. For some, it's very helpful. But we must also ask the questions, how does diet and nutrition, supplements, sleep hygiene, stress management, exercise, and more play a role in managing these symptoms? My guest today is Dana Key. She is a board-certified holistic health and nutrition practitioner, two times international best-selling author, and the CEO and founder of ADHD Thrive Institute. As a mother of a child with ADHD, she knows firsthand the struggles that come with parenting a neurodiverse child and the freedom that is possible once parents learn to reduce ADHD symptoms. Dana has been featured in Forbes and Authority Magazine and on Medium, Thrive Global, and various other online media. She has also been a guest at multiple parenting and ADHD summits and podcasts. Her mission is to help families reduce ADHD symptoms naturally so that children with ADHD can thrive at home, at school, and in life. And just a short medical disclaimer before we dive in, by listening to this podcast, you agree not to use this podcast as medical advice or for making any lifestyle changes to treat any medical condition in either yourself or others. Consult your own physician for any medical issues that you may be having. This entire disclaimer also applies to any of my guests on my podcast. So sit back and stay open-minded and let's join and welcome Dana to the podcast. Thank you. Hi, Donna. Welcome to the Health Trip Podcast. Thank you, Jill. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. You are someone that I needed way back when my kids were really little and a couple of them had ADHD, which is the topic of our conversation today. And you probably, you're so much younger than me. You probably weren't even around at that time, or, <laughs> but man, I could have used you in my back pocket. Mm -hmm. I know I hear that story quite often actually through my journey of things so I totally understand I could have used me when I started my journey (laughs) right right it's it's tough and I want to know how you even got on this journey you know and and how when you got on the journey how it pivoted to a very natural and holistic um, direction 
Yeah, there's a there's definitely a story behind that one. And uh, between you and me, I was actually an accountant in a past life. Wow. Uh, and I, I actually, you know, plan to continue in, in that field. And I might have done so, you know, if the concerns over my son's health hadn't grown as much as they did. He uh, was always one of those really active children, couldn't sit still, bouncing off the walls. He'd have the most mammoth meltdowns and tantrums. And I always sort of had a feeling in my gut that there was something a little bit different from him. But I'd always press and ask the teachers or the doctor and they'd be like, he's just a boy, don't worry. Like even at the age of two, I thought "Mm, there's something a little bit different. But then, uh, you know, eventually his tantrums became more severe. He became more hyperactive. And that's when it all sort of caught up with him at the age of four. And the teachers started noticing the differences as well. And we went to the doctor, as most people do. He was diagnosed with ADHD and he was immediately put on medication. Now, at first, I remember feeling really relieved, actually, with the diagnosis because I wasn't a bad mum. You know, I I could say that it wasn't my parenting. uh, Mm -hmm. And I was actually excited to feel the medication, thinking, you know, we were finally going to get the help that we needed. But then his, you know, dosage increased. Uh, they added on more medication. He started to get side effects and they became worse and worse. Uh, The doctor prescribed another prescription to counteract the side effects of the first. And this continued until he was on three very strong meds. And at this time he was five. Now, when the doctor suggested the fourth medication to counteract some new side effects that have popped up, I just thought to myself, this is not okay. This this does not seem right to me. And I, I couldn't do it anymore. And so that's when my career path completely changed. I went back to school to my holistic health degree, multiple specific certifications in this particular area, and just dove into all the research and the science and the studies to really work out how to help you in other ways. And, you know, I learned how food can affect so many aspects of our body um, and of our lives. I learned that ADHD symptoms can be reduced naturally. Uh, now today, my son is almost 13. He's in middle school. Uh, he's a straight A student. He just got a B. He's very disappointed. <laughs> uh, but most importantly, none of that matters really. It's he's happy. And my family's happy and and now we have peace and calm in our house. And, you know, once I learned about the importance of food on behavior, once I learned about the gut-brain connection, you know, and once I saw that all of these changes to food and these other natural strategies had on my own family, I just couldn't keep this information to myself anymore. And I, I just didn't want anyone else to have to go through the struggles my family went through uh, uh, over the years. And, you know, um, I just wanted them to get to a better place so much quicker. And I've been fortunate enough now to have worked with close to a thousand other families to help them get to the same place as me, but just so much quicker and without as much struggle as I went through. Yeah. That's a very similar story to mine and to, you know, thousands of other parents out there, right? You go to the doctor, you come home with a script and then that has side effects. So now you go back and you get another script and mine were on layers too. And so does Mm -hmm. your son still take medication? He's completely off. That is amazing. Yeah. Yeah, Amazing. He's completely off and he's, he's thriving. Uh, And I just, I, 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 every time I think back to that, he was on three meds at the age of five, it just gives me, it gives me chills actually. So uh, no, he's doing really, really well. Yeah. I talked about some of those symptoms in the, um, in the opening and Mm -hmm. you start to lose your child. Like it's not even your child anymore. He wasn't. And he was a shell of himself and, you know, he was such an outgoing kid and you know, was so friendly, but he became really introverted. He became really anxious. He couldn't sleep. He didn't want to eat. And, you know, he would just sort of stand there like completely dazed and it just wasn't, wasn't my son. Yeah. Oh, well, good for you. Good for him. And good for all of us. I mean, all of us lucky parents out there who Mm. get to end up working with someone like you with all this knowledge and experience. Yeah. Let's dive into ADHD. What is the actual definition of ADHD? Yeah, so it stands for Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. And the American Psychological Association explains it as 
a behavioral condition that makes focusing on everyday requests and routines challenging. So, uh, you know, that can mean multiple different things. And now some of the most common characteristics would be hyperactivity, which my, my son definitely had. Impulsivity, he also had that. Uh, acting without thinking a lot mm-hmm. of the time. <laughs> Inability to sit still, he had that too. Constant fidgeting, Mm -hmm. Uh, often appearing to be run by a motor, Um, you know, also inability to focus on tasks uh, that, you know, don't interest them. They can, they can hyper-focus on things that really interest them. And so that's why a lot of the time parents actually think to themselves, oh, he probably doesn't have ADHD because he can spend hours playing Legos or hours on games. You know, it's really the inability to focus on things that don't interest them. A lot of the time they have a tendency to interrupt. Emotional dysregulation is big and it doesn't happen to every kid, but it's often the hardest because, you know, those tantrums and the meltdowns, they often stop the whole family, uh, which was what happened to us. And, you know, I'd wake up every morning dreading the day ahead of what mood my son was going to be in. Now, uh, sometimes children with ADHD often struggle socially. They can be aggressive. I've got a family in my program right now uh, who is just started with us. And at the age of four, her son picked up a knife and threw it at her. Uh, But that's not him. It's not, it's not him. It's what's going on underneath in his body. That's driving that. So that's just a a couple of the common symptoms. And is this just genetic or can this be triggered by um, environmental factors as well? Oh, look, um, uh, that's a really, really great question. And I want to actually tell you a story. Now, there, if we just look at what the like what the, the research suggests, it does say that there's a genetic link between, for ADHD, parent and siblings of someone who has ADHD, for instance, are more likely to have ADHD themselves. But uh, over the years, uh, I know you talk a lot about genetics, but over the years, uh, I've done a number of DNA tests on me and my son more for research for my, my business and and my Mm -hmm. clients. And I just did one recently and they have a mood and behavior section and uh, it came back and it said ADHD tendencies, which was fantastic. And that's why I wanted to test it on it because, you know, this would be a great addition to, to my practice. So my sons came back and it said ADHD tendencies. Uh, Your genetics do not predispose you to having any ADHD tendencies. You're a low risk But then it goes on to say, however, you may experience ADHD tendencies based on your lifestyle, your Mm. diet and other environmental factors. So uh, I will tell you that in the close to thousand families that I have worked with, about 50% of them, the only thing that we've done is changed their diet and the symptoms disappeared. So if we apply that 50% you know, ratio to the 6 million children who have been Mm -hmm. diagnosed with ADHD in the USA today, Mm -hmm. that probably means that it's not genetics that is causing these symptoms. It's probably diet or lifestyle or environmental factors. Because once you can fix those, the symptoms disappear. So that means that most likely there's probably about 3 million kids that have been wrongly diagnosed with ADHD. I was just going to ask you that. And that is crazy that Mm -hmm. doctors just can't seem to figure out, let's start with lifestyle factors first, see where we go. Because, you know, I do believe that there is a place in a time in a child that might need and benefit from medication along with lifestyle factors. Completely agree. But, you know, to be uh, given that as the first port of call is, right. is so wrong. Um, you know, the doctors should be giving, and I'm going to like totally do a plug here, but the doctor should be giving my book, which is Thriving with ADHD, a guide to naturally reducing ADHD symptoms in your child as the first port of call. You know, there are no side effects with changing diet. There are no side effects in bringing in a few supplementation, no side effects in reducing toxins in your house. So start with that, see where you land, you know, and then if you do need a little bit of medication, that's okay. You know, you've got to what else is going on in the body. So you need lesser dose of medication. That's my opinion anyway. Yep. Yeah. That's all really interesting. And so I know that you talk a lot about nutrition and we're going to dive deep into all of that nutrition and supplements, but I want to start with how some of the functional tests or labs that you use with your clients. 
Yeah, look, um, I do a number of different tests and I, I think that, um, you know, there's so many different ones out there. Uh, you know, there's no one single test to sort of diagnose ADHD. And, you know, from my point of view, I don't diagnose or treat anything specifically. We just look for these healing opportunities uh, mm. in uh, in our children. But there are several functional lab testing that we use to identify those sort of underlying stresses. Yeah. There are four base tests that I use, but then I do do other tests as second round of investigation because kids adapt really, really quickly. Uh, so the first test I do is called is a stool test, uh, basically looking at the state of the gut. It really gives us that clear picture of what's going on, parasites, bacteria, yeast overgrowth, you know, is there inflammation in the gut, those sort of things. And I, I, I think I want to tie gut health with with ADHD because it's there's Absolutely. a huge connection and um, the gut brain connection. And, you know, there's a very close connection between the gut and the brain. And one of the si first signs of disconnect in a brain is a gut that's not functioning well. Now, the brain has many areas that are involved in gut function, but one of the main areas is the frontal lobe. And I'm, if you're mm -hmm. only listening, I'm pointing to, you know, just between the eyes and the forehead. And um, it talks to the gut via nerve branches and two-way chemical messengers. Now, the frontal lobe is involved in things like attention and focus and executive function and planning and organizing and problem solving, all of which are common symptoms that most of our ADHD kiddos are struggling with. But also, and I think this is the real kicker for me, you know, as I said earlier, like emotional dysregulation uh, is common, but it's also probably one of the hardest symptoms. But the gut is responsible for making 95% of our serotonin and 50% mm -hmm. of our dopamine, which are our happy, feel good neurotransmitters or hormones that regulate our emotions. They maintain our mood balance and our cognitive function. And again, these are areas that most kids with ADHD have problems with. So parents find that once they can actually heal the gut, that a lot of those symptoms fall away. Emotional dysregulation and meltdowns and tantrums is usually the first thing to go. Uh, within my, with my son, it was literally within two weeks. He was a different kid. That's because we were able to reduce the inflammation that was causing that emotional dysregulation in him. So that's one of the tests. Um, uh, definitely use that for everyone. The next one is an organic acid test. And mm -hmm. um, I love the organic acid test. It, it, you know, it's a great test, looks at over, you know, 70 different important markers in the whole body and how it's functioning. It can show you the need for specific nutrients such as B vitamins, which are really important for our compromised kids. Diet modification, so things with salicylates and oxalates, which are chemical compounds found in some really healthy foods. Uh, right. It looks at your detoxification pathways, oxidative stress, yeast, mold, uh, mitochondrial function, which, you know, maybe some of these don't mean much, but basically it's a really good bang for your buck test. <laughs> you get Absolutely. a lot of markers. Yeah, definitely. Um, the next test I do is a food sensitivity panel. Now, in my experience, the best one currently out there is from a lab called Vibrant Wellness mm -hmm. uh, because it actually looks at foods down to the peptide level of the food rather than the just the top protein level. And so, you know, I find sometimes with the top protein level, you get a lot of false positives and false negatives because yeah. foods have similar protein structures. But like egg, for example, we do an egg zoomer and it looks at like 18 different peptides inside the egg white and the egg yolk. Uh, and they can be so highly reactive, but then you do a food sensitivity panel, it comes up negative. So uh, uh, that's why I use that test. And, you know, uh, when, uh, when you eat food, uh, which I know that you know all of this, but just for the listeners, <laughs> absolutely, uh, the, you know, our gut breaks down that food into micronutrient sized particles. And those particles go through the lining <laughs> of the gut into our cells to give us the nutrients we need so we can function optimally. However, uh, our, a lot of our kids have something called leaky gut, which I'm sure you've probably talked about <laughs> on this podcast, um, which is basically the breakdown of the lining of the gut. And it forms these large holes in the lining. Mm -hmm. Now, when we eat food, even the healthiest food before the gut has had a chance to break it down, it can go through the holes in the gut and into our bloodstream. <coughs> now, when something foreign goes into our bloodstream, our body recognizes it as a foreign object, turns on an immune response. <clears throat> but if that 
foreign object is a large macronutrient or protein, then your immune system might start sending signals to create an immune response and start creating antibodies and start attacking it. Now, what happens with that and the bad thing that happens with that, the body has a really great memory. So anytime you eat that again, it sees that it's dangerous, creates for further inflammation, and it continues to further break down the lining of the gut. So something starts leaky gut, then leaky gut creates food sensitivities, and then food sensitivities continue to create leaky gut. So it's this vicious cycle. Yeah. Uh, so we want to break that, take those foods out temporarily so we can heal the gut. So that's the next one. And then the last one is something called a cryptopyrrole test. Uh, and I use this specifically for kids with ADHD and mood issues because pyrroles are a normal sort of uh, process in the body that happens, uh, but they attach to vitamin B6 and zinc and draw them out of the body. So if you've got elevated levels of pyrroles, it can result in a dra dramatic deficiency of zinc and B6. Now, symptoms of pyrrole include you know, poor tolerance to physical or emotional stress, poor anger control, depression, mood issues, uh, sensitivity to light and sound, tactile sensitivities, and a lot more. But a lot of those symptoms, you know, are directly related to ADHD, depression, you know, those sort of things. So that's the fourth test that I do. And I do a lot more than that, but they're my base test to get that overview of that high level picture. Yeah, I love that you bring in all of these lab tests. I hadn't heard of the last one <laughs> that you were talking about, but gathering data, I'm all about gather all the data because this is like a cheat sheet to help you pivot your child yes. into the direction where they're going to thrive. Definitely. Sure. And I, and I say this all the time to my, my clients who are adult, mostly adults is you're only really as healthy as your mitochondria and you we're talking about how these nutrients break down in our gut and eventually make it into our bloodstream and they're supposed to get into our cell. But that yes. doesn't, even if you're eating a very nutrient dense diet, there could be other things going on inside your body. It could be your gut dysbiosis. It could be genetics. There, it could be chronic inflammation that inhibit your cell's ability to bring in all of these bioavailable nutrients in the yeah. right, in the therapeutic dose that you need to thrive. 100% agree with yeah. everything that you said. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. And, and also I've done some of the food tests, not the one you're talking about from Vibrant America, but some of the other ones. And what's interesting is you get back, you could get back a false positive for sure, mm -hmm. but Sometimes you get back something and maybe it says you shouldn't be eating kale or spinach and there's oxalates in there, right? Yes. And so even though to a many people out there that is a health food, to some people, it's detrimental to their health. A thousand percent. And that's why I love actually doing the organic acid test with it because you can actually see right. if there is an overload of those oxalates. And oxalates can be, you know, terrible uh, for the body. They form these crystals. You can go into your yep. muscles, into your brain, come out in the urine. And so uh, definitely an area that you want to want to check out for sure. Now, when you do these lab tests, do you work with some clients who benefit from pharmacology and gathering all this data to pivot their lifestyle? Or are you just about pivoting away from the medications? So uh, I think that um, there's a time and place for medication, uh, definitely. And, you know, but to, uh, you know, be constantly uh, increasing the dose, adding new meds to treat symptoms is not the best way. Um, and the reason, you know, I really like to use these tests, it, it, it really helps us identify those root causes or those underlying stresses rather than that traditional model of, you know, using a Band-Aid approach where, you know, they just slap a Band-Aid on symptoms. So I, I do believe that it's much better to dig deep into what's going on in the first place. Now, uh, there are a number of different, you know, drugs and medicine out there to help with ADHD. Um, some of them are stimulant medication, like, mm -hmm. you know, most people would have heard of like Ritalin. Um, there are SSRIs that help with depression and anxiety. There are also some non-stimulants. And so those are the, the couple of medications that are used for ADHD. But I think that even if you are on medication, this needs to happen first or this needs yeah. to happen in conjunction because 
inflammation in the body is driving symptoms. It is making it worse. It is not normal, even for a kid with ADHD to be melting down, you know, once a day for over an hour. That's not normal. That is a sign that there is something going on in that kid's body and saying, mom, mom, please, please get my body checked out. There's something else going on. So, you know, I think that there can definitely be a balance between using meds and lifestyle. You know, for my son, meds were great at first, but they did more harm than good. Um, But once we started to see the improvements in him, you know, with this diet, this lifestyle, getting to the root cause, the symptoms started to go away and we were no longer needing medication. We slowly titrated off it in consultation with our doctor. And, you know, so he is totally med free. Other families reduce the the medication right down to such a low dose. And then they don't want to touch it because everything's great. And I'm like, you know, you've got to make that decision that's best for your family. And if they're happy and their kids happy and they're all thriving, then that's okay. Now, medications do unfortunately create toxicity as well, create Mm -hmm. gut breakdown. But, you know, if you are keeping that lifestyle changes, if you're keeping that inflammation low and you still need a small dose, that's okay. You know, you need to give your permission, yourself permission to do whatever works best for your family. And there is not a one size fits all thing. You know, every family has to do what's best for them, but you know, no matter what someone decides about medication, the changes we recommend families make are always beneficial for everyone. Yeah, that sounds great, but I could see how people would come to this approach and there would be some fear lingering in their mind about changing the medication, titrating off the medication, because you don't know you've lived with this for so long Mm -hmm. in one way. And then to, but I love that there's a transition period and you do it slowly. Uh, It's not all or nothing. And so that the child feels safe and secure and confident that he's on the right path for himself. Oh, definitely. And you know, when that time is like, you just know it and, you know, symptoms start to slowly fall away. And then you're like, oh, well, you know, I just go down half a dose or, or what, or or even a quarter and you let it level out. You're like, oh, this is a good, this is good. And then they may test some more. And, you know, there is no one size fits all approach. And look, some families come to me not what they're wanting to avoid medication. Others come to me in the same situation that I was in with my son being on three or four meds and wanting to get off some uh, and other families, you know, a combination. So uh, everyone just needs to, there's no shame in whatever path a family takes uh, and everyone needs to do what's right for them. But I will say that, you know, in a critical situation where a kid might be hurting themselves or hurting other people, you know, you should definitely go with the doctor's advice uh, because there's something going on that he needs, that person needs to get back into that balanced state before you can even try any of this. They're not going to be open to trying it unless they get off that, that fight or flight that they're currently in. Right. So you have a food first approach. So now we've done the lab testing and I would imagine that nutrition would be probably the next, the next uh, step in line. Yes. Yeah. So tell so, us about your food first approach. Yeah, look, um, uh, you know, as I said, I'm not against medication, um, not, you know, but I don't think it should be the first course of action. Yeah. Uh, you know, not when food can sometimes be even more effective with no side effects to worry about. You know, if parents want to reduce ADHD symptoms in their children, they must do something much more than just giving them a pill or even just a supplement. Supplements can be very effective. So can medication. But if children continue to eat processed inflammatory foods like gluten, dairy, and soy, these ADHD symptoms are not going to go away because the foods they are eating are exacerbating symptoms. So food first means that rather than trying to find a magic pill that's going to fix a child, we clean up their diet instead. And in doing this, we reduce inflammation and then the symptoms start to reduce because we're getting to the bottom of what's causing these symptoms in the first place. I often um, think of it like this, when you're building a house, a solid foundation isn't optional, it's a necessity. And if you don't have a solid foundation, that house isn't going to be very strong. And it's the same way with us. Diet is our foundation. And if our diet is poor, we can never function at our best. And that's true for us adults, but it's also very true for our children. 
So what is it about gluten, dairy, and soy that is so bad? Because those things are in almost everything. And as a kid, and as a mom of a young kid, and for me, a mom of five that were young one day, a uh, long time ago, very challenging, Yeah. right? You can, you can control what's in your home, but then I sent them to the hockey rink to go play hockey and they would come back all like jacked up from candy mm-hmm. or some mom brought you know, cupcakes or cookies. Yeah, no, look, you're, you're exactly right. And these are, these are the obstacles that, you know, may stop families. Um, but, you know, obviously working with someone like myself, uh, this is what we're trained in and this is what we are good with. And so the way that we've actually developed our program is we've got modules on all of those obstacles that you just brought up, how to deal with them when they come up. But, you know, Gluten in particular, you know, is probably one of the most inflammatory foods out there for everyone. Um, and it, it leads to increased intestinal permeability, um, which is which is leaky gut. And, um, you know, when you've got the breakdown of the lining of the gut, uh, you know, all of that bad bacteria can go into the bloodstream. All of that dysbiosis, as you were mentioning earlier, can go through the vagus nerve up into the brain and can cause all of these symptoms. So basically gluten creates leaky gut leaky gut creates inflammation and Mm -hmm. inflammation creates all of these symptoms. So, you know, we find that once we can remove our gluten, um, you know, as a, as a priority, uh, we can start to heal the gut. We can start to reduce inflammation. Now, dairy is also highly inflammatory, you know, in a different way, but gluten and dairy in particular create um, this opioid-like response in the brain as well. They, they attach to opioid receptors um, and they actually have these antibodies Uh, So like, for example, gluten, you can have created antibodies in your body called glutamorphin and protonorphin. And these two antibodies, if you haven't have them, actually create neuropsychological symptoms, uh, things like depression, mood swings. And what happens is if you are eating gluten and you've got them and you go on a gluten-free diet, you can have gluten withdrawal. And a lot of parents say to me like, oh my God, we went on a gluten-free diet and he was worse than what he actually Mm -hmm. uh, was before. And I'm like, bear with it, stick with it for a couple of weeks. I will tell you he's going through gluten withdrawal. And once you get past that, it will be okay. And it is always, but if you've got no one to guide you through that, uh, they're probably thinking, well, no, he's obviously not sensitive to gluten. Um, uh, and, and, and dairy is the same. It's got casamorphin in it. You know, if you listen to it, glutamorphin, casamorphin mm. sounds mm-hmm. like morphine, yep. you know? And so, uh, it's exactly the same, you know, you can have someone who's addicted to morphine and, uh, they can be functioning one day. They can have complete emotional dysregulation the next day. And he's, they've got to go through a withdrawal response. Same with gluten, same with dairy. So when you look at the food sensitivity results, Mm -hmm. do you see gluten and dairy come up most of the time? And if not, is it confusing for the parents to get on board with you to take it out of their diet? Very good question. So I use something called a wheat zoomer from Vibrant Wellness. It looks at probably like 20 to 30 different markers Mm -hmm. inside gluten and wheat. So I like to look at it like um, uh, gluten is like Uh, a Lego masterpiece car. Okay. And there are all these little compounds inside it and they're the individual uh, Lego pieces. So, you know, the glutamorphin might be a yellow uh, Lego piece um, and protonorphin might be the blue Lego piece. And so we're actually checking all those different pieces. I can tell you in all the wheat zoomers I've done, every single kid showed up reactive to Mm. multiple areas of gluten and wheat. Um, I've done one wheat zoomer on one person and it showed up with nothing. That was my own son when he had been gluten-free for about five or six years. And so that shows us that he is doing a gluten-free diet the right way. Um, And that's the only time I've seen, I was actually expecting it to come back, you know, red. I'm like, Mm -hmm. but it was completely empty. So I can tell you it's pretty much reactive in everyone. I actually don't do many dairy zoomers. That's because, you know, we take it out and it's actually really easy to test back in later. You know, and the goal for this process when trying to reduce ADHD symptoms naturally is to reduce inflammation enough to allow the healing to occur. And so by removing gluten, dairy and soy, plus any food sensitivities, it allows it to reduce enough to allow the healing to occur. And when we get into that better place, you know, if the families really want to test back 
dairy, even though, you know, I say I wouldn't, um, you know, they may test back goat's milk or goat's cheese, something Mm -hmm. less inflammatory. Um, And so, but honestly, it, it always comes up. Uh, and I don't suggest doing a dairy zoomer. So uh, we don't have to worry about whether or not it does or does not come up. So this is not an elimination type diet that you're going for here. This is lifelong. Look, I think gluten in particular is a lifelong thing and it should yeah. be for everyone. I it's agree. so highly inflammatory for everyone. It is probably behind so much illness and disease in our world today. And so I don't recommend anyone add a bag. Dairy and soy, everyone has to do it on a case by case basis and um, and their family and their child. I don't particularly add back dairy. I don't particularly add back soy. Every now and again, you know, maybe about 18 months to two years into our journey, my son would have non-GMO organic soy, uh, you know, in the form of like edamame beans, but that's it. Uh, and we may have every now and again, some, some goat's cheese or or goat's milk, but we're fully gluten, dairy, soy free, except for those occasional, um, but never have we ever added or tested back in gluten and we never will. So a lot of times when people take gluten out of their diet, they often put in gluten-free products and these products are almost just as harmful as the gluten because of all the starches and the sugars, you know, it's the Mm gluten-free Oreos, the gluten-free crackers, all these highly processed foods. What is your um, approach on that with parents? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I always say that you can't replace packaged goods with packaged goods. Mm -hmm. And a gluten-free diet is not necessarily healthy. So we really do try to focus on those whole foods. Uh, I do give families uh, shopping list to all the major, you know, you know, Whole Foods, Costco, Amazon, Walmart, all of them um, for better for you uh, packaged goods. But, you know, we do want to focus on those whole nutritious fresh fruits and veggies, animal, uh, you know, grass fed animal proteins, such as meat, poultry, seafood, eggs, lots of plenty uh, healthy fats like avocado, coconut oil, um, and olive oil, and then also, you know, lots of spring water to really help the body detox and also remove toxins that are already there, but also you're avoiding harmful chemicals that are in some waters. So really focusing on that. And also like, if you pick up a package and there's a, there's a something in it that you can't pronounce, put it back. That's my, my rule of thumb. And I try to stick with packaged goods that have sort of less than five or six ingredients in them, as long as you can pronounce them all. So completely agree with you. You can't replace packaged goods with packaged goods. So while many doctors might think this is absolute BS, are there studies out there that show that changing this, the child's diet will have benefit effects to them? Yeah. Look, I have run into many non-believers in I my bet. time. <laughs> And um, it's usually, unfortunately, a lot of the time, the father, uh, as it was with my husband. Um, he used to be one of them. Sorry, husband, sitting upstairs. I hope he doesn't always throw him under the bus. Um, but, uh, you know, it was the science that first made me rethink the direction we were traveling with my son. Mm. Um, you know, uh, it was the science that eventually got my husband on board. Um, so uh, I'll share a couple of studies with you. And I think that these are some of the best. There's plenty out there, though. It was a study in 2015 um, uh, concluded that 64% of children diagnosed with ADHD were actually experiencing a hypersensitivity to food. Mm. 64%, you know, is a lot. And I wonder what yep. might happen if these children change their diets and remove the foods that they were sensitive to, you know, is it possible that these ADHD symptoms would disappear or, you know, at least become more manageable? I personally (laughs) know and believe that it is. Um, There was another study uh, that showed 56% of ADHD kids tested positive for food allergies compared to less than 8% of kids in the general population. Mm. So that tells me there is a yeah. clear correlation between ADHD and food allergies. There was another study in uh, 2017 um, that concluded that the addition of micronutrients in the diet improved overall function, reduced impairments, uh, improved attention, emotional regulation, and aggression. So 
clearly medication is not the only way to help children with ADHD. And as I said, I could keep going on and on, but I'm sure we have other important things to talk about. A little funny story is my kids would beg me not to go into the, the doctor's room, the office with them. They wanted me to wait in the car and they were little. They're like, mom, we don't want you coming in. We don't want you asking questions. We don't want you getting into a debate with the doctor. Cause it was always <laughs> like that. You know, this is before I pivoted to more uh, of a more functional medicine approach, but yeah, yeah. I always got kicked out. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So we're talking about food, but there's a segue into skincare, body care, toothpaste, all mm-hmm. the things we put on our skin and in our mouth for staying clean and yeah. how this, how these ingredients also have a negative impact on kids with ADHD. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, th- I think when we're looking at everything, we're looking at stress management and, you know, stress management can come in so many different forms. That's like, you know, external stress that we know too, all too well, um, but there's yeah. also that internal stress. What is causing inflammation in the body? And, you know, a lot of these skincare products, a lot of these, um, uh, you know, um, house like um, cleaning products, uh, cleaning products, sorry, completely Mm -hmm. mental blank, uh, cleaning products. uh, They've got toxins in them and toxins create inflammation. So we've got to look at all these avenues that could be contributing to the inflammation. For some, it may just be simple as food, but usually not. So we really want to look at the environment, the lifestyle, the Mm -hmm. diet, the underlying stresses, uh, you know, what you're putting in your body, what you're putting on your body, uh, what you're breathing in. I mean, uh, you know, the the toxins in the air these days, um, the EMF exposure from uh, from your computer, from your mobile phone, from, you know, all of the Wi-Fi in your house. I mean, you know, it does, when we start to dive deep into it, it does get a little bit like overwhelming, but I will yeah. just really go back to the fact, you know, and I'll just tell parents listening out there, don't stress too much. Uh, and Rome wasn't built in a day. You know, you do not need to make all of these changes in a day. Uh, you can take it slow, look for the biggest, you know, the lowest hanging fruit. Uh, and that might be, you know, going on to ewg.org and looking yeah. up at personal care products to see how they rate and then changing one at a time when one finishes or looking at the cleaning products. Are your cleaning products toxic? One at a time, change them out. Uh, and look, there's also things like heavy metals and mold and all of this stuff. So what's going on in the, in the house and the environment? But I, I, I think that that all comes with time. The best thing that families can do right away is to really start just getting deep into that body, feeding it with that good stuff, taking out the bad stuff. And then as, you know, things start changing, that's when you start experimenting with these other things. Um, But we are going to get exposure to toxins no matter what. There's nothing we can do to avoid it. But there is definitely things that you can do to help your body detox from this. So things like exercise. I mean, it's probably one of the, the best treatments for ADHD out there, but also it is great for detoxification. Things like red light therapy, you know, the sauna, mm-hmm. red light saunas and things like that, that helps with um, with detoxification. Mm-hmm. Uh, also, it's actually really helps with sweet sleep quality as well um, mm-hmm. and might even help with the body's production of melatonin. Um, that's because the light plays such an important part of the body's circadian rhythm. So, uh, you know, um, things like Epsom salts, uh, magnesium baths, detox baths. My kids do a detox baths three times a week um, and they they soak in uh, the magnesium flakes uh, and um, for 20 minutes. That's how, a great way to detox. That's a great idea. And also it's just so nice and quiet in there. They could probably get a two for one and meditate while they were in there. A thousand percent, a thousand yeah. percent, a little, mm-hmm. a few little essential oils to really help them relax, Love that. you know, detox the body out. Uh, and I always suggest that to my families as a part of what they're doing with me, because it really does help that. 
things like milk, milk, milk thistle tea. That's an easy one as well. That mm-hmm. will help um, detoxification. And for kids, especially getting them out onto a trampoline, rebounding is amazing for detoxification, but also to um, help fire off the neurons in the brain, mm-hmm. you know, before school to help them focus better and then get out lots of the energy that they have. I want to go back to red light therapy because I love red light therapy. I mm-hmm. have my, I, I get my kids a little at home devices to use. Um, I have one as well. And there was a study in 2019 that showed that red light therapy used with kids with ADHD helped uh, regulate their microbiome or get their microbiome mm. back to where it was supposed to be, right? The integrity awesome. of their microbiome. And I thought that was so cool because it is safe for kids. You yes. know, it's not just for adults. It is very safe for kids. It's quiet time. It's you're getting that red light. So you're getting away from that blue light if you do it in the evening. Mm-hmm. So have you ever heard of the way it works with the uh, the gut? No, I haven't actually. And oh, I'll really have to share. Yeah, yeah I'll put that study it. in the show notes and send it to you. It's really, it was really in- incredible. Um, yeah. What are some other things kids can do to relieve stress? Do you go as far as like blue light blocking glasses and helping yeah, them get so- off screens at night? Look, um, uh, minimizing screens for sure, uh, as much as possible. Every family is going to have their own limits, but, you know, not only do they add to the EMF exposure, but, you know, in terms of, you know, messing up that circadian rhythm at nighttime in that, in that blue light is definitely something that we suggest, uh, you know, when we, when we see the sun go down, that's when the blue light needs to stop. Um, uh, and you know, we always say for sure, at least an hour before bedtime, uh, I like to suggest um, a really good quality uh, uh, bedtime routine um, is really, really important. Um, things like uh, I love obviously meditation, but a lot of kids find it quite boring. And so instead, what I suggest is one of those adult coloring books. They've got these tiny little squares and they're huge and they literally sit there and color and that's meditation but they don't know it. The other one you can do is the adult dot to dot books. They've got like 1500 dots on this one page. And so going, drawing from one dot to the next dot, to the next dot, to the next dot, that is meditating as well. And so some of these little kid tricks are actually really good. Um, You know, there's a, there's a program called Ziva Kids and uh, the Ziva adults as well, but it, it helps teach kids on their level about meditation. I do love that. And I suggest that for families as well, you know, getting into that routine of even if it's five minutes a day to start uh, and do it as a family, because this whole process of going through what we teach inside our program and everything that your listeners go through, everything mm-hmm. that your, your clients go through, it is life-changing. And we're trying to create not only fixing this family unit but creating these habits for life I mean if my mom had taught me how to meditate like when I was a child oh my gosh it would have been so much simpler to start learning you know in my right. 30s um you know and I'm, I'm I'm in my 40s now and I just I, I still don't do it very well because it's you know it is hard but you know to to teach them at a young age to have these stress reduction techniques are not only going to help them now, it's going to help them into their teenage years and into their adult life for sure, when they actually probably really appreciate it more than they do when they're children. So definitely meditation is huge. Um, and that quality bedtime routine, one hour before bed uh, and, um, you know, that bath time, relaxation time by themselves in their room, read a book with the parents and then to bed. And that's such a great point that these are lifelong, healthy habits that we're forming and helping our kids form for for the rest of their lives, right? Yeah. And while the diagnosis up front is terrifying and uh, overwhelming and all the things you're talking about and putting them together, I could see that some pa- parents might be sitting there listening to this thinking, oh my God, how am I going to get all of this done? At the end of the day, your child is going to be one healthy teenager and young adult into adulthood and already know how to practice self-care, cook mm-hmm. for themselves, understand how to read a menu and order properly off of it, you know, how to shop in a grocery store. My kids, I'm, I look at them in their 20s now and I think, oh my gosh, they actually paid attention to me because they're doing it. They are living proof that it can be done. 
Yeah, and I, it, it's it's an amazing, uh, amazing journey. It really is. Yeah. I mean, I, I look back, even though mine was super hard, uh, but I look back and I think, wow, like I am myself a, is such a, I am such a different person. You know, the, the growth that I've had as a parent, as a woman, uh, as a as a human being has been amazing and I would not change it for the world. And I feel full of life. And I just think that, you know, what it's done for our family and for, you know, our life and our children is amazing. And so, you know, that's really what we, tr- what we try to focus on, but also try to focus going really slowly. It doesn't need to be overwhelming like, you know, it may seem, but these are lifestyle changes that can be taken through their whole life. Yeah. So there's a correlation between ADHD and drug addiction. And eventually these kids are going to grow up right? Mm -hmm. And they're going to hit high school and they're going to be faced with making, having to make some serious decisions about what path to go down. What are your thoughts and knowledge on the correlation between those two? Yeah, look, I, I, I've heard that a lot. I, I honestly don't put too much focus on it. Um, For me, it's about reducing reducing the symptoms in the body before the need to self-medicate and you know we're teaching them these lifestyle habits these tips these tricks these uh symptom reduction tools that will actually allow them to be much better maybe not need to self-medicate as they get older and i think that Mm -hmm. like you know I, i look at so many you know it's really the luck of the draw uh, you know, you've got um, so many kids out there that, you know, if they hang out with the wrong people, they could become a drug addict. Um, uh, whereas, you know, I've spoken to so many actually families and friends that have got, you know, a sibling that has been a drug addict and they didn't have ADHD or they didn't have depression. So, you know, yes, there may be uh, a, a slight correlation or an increased chance because they are looking to self-medicate for sure. Yes. Yeah. But let's get to the root of that reason. Why are they looking to self-medicate? Because they don't feel good. Okay, what can we do about it? Let's get to the root cause of why they don't feel good, why the serotonin's not being made properly, why the dopamine's not being made properly, why they can't focus. You know, there are so many reasons for why. Let's do that so they know what to do when they're not feeling good. Just like you were telling me before we started today in that your children know now know how to be healthy. They know Mm -hmm. that if they're feeling off track, what they need to do to get back on track. So let's teach them young. Let's teach them young. Let's reduce that inflammation when they're young so they don't end up there. Yeah. And I'd like to add um, to the correlation between ADHD and substance abuse is that whole self-regulation. Even kids who are taking medications are still drawn towards self-regulating through abusing substances. So I think, you know, it can go both ways and it's upsetting that the conventional medical healthcare system doesn't acknowledge that and, and help parents prepare for that and make better decisions. Yeah. definitely. So thank goodness for people like you. Yeah. Thank you. And you, you're doing the same, but for a different population, you know, and it's, we've just got to get that word out there. Mm -hmm. uh, And we've got to just keep showing up and showing up and and spreading the word no matter what we do. And and that's really why I I wrote the book, because, you know, I'm not going to be able to help every family out there. And, you know, I want to be able to, you know, shout it from the rooftops sorry about that. Oh, Uh, no, we got a a cameo. I love it. Uh, (laughs) He's actually homesick today. Um, That's my little one. I'm sorry. I don't know why he he doesn't normally um, come in when my door shut. Apologies. Um, So uh, tell us about your book. Yeah. So um, look, this is this is the guide that I needed all those years ago. Uh, I searched high and low for something that was going to help me help reduce my son's ADHD symptoms. And I could never, ever, ever find it. And there was a, you know, a writer, Tony Morrison, he said that, you know, if there's a book that you really want to read and you can't find it, then you must write it. And Mm. that's what I did. And it, it goes through not only my story, but stories of other families that have been through my program and gives them step by step on how to get started, you know, how to start changing the diet, why it's bad. You know, when you know the why, 
you're more likely to follow through. It's so funny. You know, the first lesson I teach in my program at, um, uh, is the why. And you've got families that listen to that why and go, oh my gosh, I need to throw everything out now. And I'm like, right. no, 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 don't do that. Rome was not built in a day. Uh, and so, you know, I lay it all out there. I talk about the lab tests. I talk about supplements. I talk about parent therapy and really just, it is like the encyclopedia for reducing ADHD symptoms naturally in children. Oh, that's wonderful. I will put that on the show notes so people know exactly where to find that. So my final question to you is, what are three things that parents can do starting today without having read the book or really researched into anything that they can start doing today for their children who have ADHD? Yeah, definitely. That's a great question. Um, Number one is focus on eating more whole foods like fruits, veggies, grass-fed meats, healthy fats, and cut out those top inflammatory foods like gluten, dairy, and soy and replace them with healthier alternatives and avoiding processed food as much as possible. But, you know, it's important to remember that, you know, when changing someone's diet, remember that it doesn't need to have to be done all at once. Um, don't try to make all the changes in day one. That's what I did. And I uh, had multiple panic attacks on the floor, stressing about what I was going to feed my family. So don't do it that way. And that's, (laughs) I don't teach that in my program. So um, well said. (laughs) what, uh, you know, what we're suggesting is pretty significant lifestyle change. And so, you know, it can be incredibly overwhelming. So start with one meal a week. You know, start with breakfast, uh, you know, change one snack at a time, clean these up and then move on to lunches. You know, there's no right or way, wrong way of doing it, but it's definitely important to, to go slow and make the changes at a pace mm-hmm. that won't overwhelm you or your family. Number two uh, is I would really recommend um, that you try to focus on building in some, you know, healthy sleep habits. It's Mm. really quite amazing what can happen when children are well rested. Um, Many of those with ADHD symptoms improve pretty dramatically just because a child is is no longer sleep deprived. And number three, um, I would recommend listeners try to get their child outside each and every day. This outside time is such an important piece of the puzzle. And it's good for all of us, but especially those with children with ADHD, getting them the exercise, getting them the vitamin D from the sunshine, getting them on the ground, doing all of that and really, really helping them. Oh, those are great tips. I love that. Thank you so much. So where can people find you? Yeah, so um, they can find me at ADHDthriveinstitute.com. I'm on Instagram, Facebook at ADHD Thrive Institute. Uh, my book, which is, you can, you can find out more at ADHD Thrive Institute forward slash book, or it's available on Amazon. And do you work one-on-one with clients or have group online options? Yeah. So we have um, two programs. We have our blue program and our gold program. Our blue Mm -hmm. program really focuses on reducing inflammation through uh, diet, uh, lifestyle changes without lab testing. And then the gold program is all that as well, but includes lab testing. And so with the lab testing one, there's more one-to-one, but we're all in that group environment. We do five weekly group coaching calls a week, every week. Uh, And it's just, especially having a child with challenges, it's just so nice to know that you're not going in alone. Um, I, I had one just before uh, I, I jumped on here today. And, um, you know, sometimes we have like one person show up. Sometimes we have 25 people show up. Mm-hmm. Today we had about 12 and there was there was a couple of new people and they're like, I just came to listen and just to realize like I'm not alone. And I've got Oh, yes. Community is huge. Yeah. So important. Well, thank you so much, Donna. It was so nice to meet you. And like I said, I really could have used you about 25 (laughs) years ago. Thank you so much. And you definitely, you do not look like you're in your forties. I thought you were much younger. I know. Well, thank you very much. I'm in my mid forties and yes, no, thank you very, very much. (laughs) I do. uh, Yeah. Maybe it's the, maybe it's the zoom, you know, on the video, it makes you look a little bit better. It's it's the lifestyle, right? What what you're doing for your child, you're also doing for yourself and it shows and that's wonderful. So thank you again. And thank you all for listening in. And I will add lots of amazing information onto the show notes. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thank you for joining me. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Lifestyle changes can be hard and overwhelming to make. 
by building your support team of functional medicine doctors, therapists, and health coaches, you can reach your optimal health goals. Be sure to check out my other podcasts. Until we meet again, stay healthy.